Many of us today value our private time. Give it an afternoon alone. We might read, catch up on our favorite TV shows, or take a luxurious bath. In the Middle Ages, an afternoon alone may have been a lot more daunting as the very concept of privacy was vastly different from what it is today. You were rarely alone from birth to death if you lived during the medieval era. The concept of privacy did not enter common law until the 18th century, and it did not become a human right until the 20th century. In this case, privacy refers to the notion that a person has a right not to have their personal activities known without their consent. There were no such thoughts in medieval times, and people who wanted to be alone were often suspected of wanting to hide something. A desire for solitude was only acceptable if it was for religious purposes. There are a few spaces where we expect the utmost privacy in the modern world. One is the bedroom. However, in medieval times, the bedroom was just another communal space. Life often would begin in the bedroom, sometimes in the family bed. Many people would attend the birth itself as labor was dangerous for both the mother and child. The larger the knowledge base of the group assisting, the higher the chance that they would survive. Everyone in the community would know about the birth, and family members, locals, and parish priests would be on hand throughout the labor. Midwives worked in teams, with reports of up to seven midwives being present for the birth. Life would be different for nobles and the upper class, but for commoners, babies and children slept in the same room as their siblings and parents, usually in one big bed and under the same blanket. Many homes of the lower classes consisted of one big room, with the bed, kitchen, and often livestock in there too. The idea that a child would be sent to their own room as punishment would have been laughable to these people. Of course, this arrangement had practical benefits since there was no central heating. As fabric was so labor-intensive, it made sense for everyone to bunk together. While many people think of medieval families being large, in actuality, only two children on average would survive into adulthood, so these beds may not have been as crowded as we imagine. Still, with only one bed, the eldest child may not have needed much sex education by the time they hit puberty. The family bed wasn't just restricted to relatives. Guests would also be welcome to sleep in the communal bed. While traveling, you would expect to sleep in the same bed as your companions or even a complete stranger. Bed sharing was so common that there was etiquette regarding sharing a bed with someone you didn't know. Lie still and don't hog the blankets. Although wealthier medieval nobles had more than one room, the bedchamber was no more private than that of the peasants. Servants often shared their lord or lady's bed, even sleeping at the foot of the marital bed, regardless of any undercover activities that might occur. The idea of witnessing the consummation of a marriage was not seen as an invasion of privacy as it would be today. Friends and families would often lead the couples to their bed, as it was seen as a natural and proper occurrence for the newly married pair to have sex. There was no embarrassment or shame in this. Noble couples took this one step further. In medieval times, a marriage needed no witness or parental permission and was only solidified by sexual intercourse. Since strategic marriages were a common occurrence amongst royalty and wealthy families, to validate a marriage, witnesses would be present at the consummation and would be able to testify that the marriage was legitimate. These bedding ceremonies varied from watching the couple get into bed to cheering them on as they completed the act. Of course, the church's view was that sex was purely for reproduction and not to be enjoyed, so you could not complain that these spectators ruined the mood, as you would be expected to be making babies rather than taking any pleasure from it. The bedroom was not thought of as a private sanctuary in those days, and it is said that kings would even hold court from their beds. It was not until the Victorian period that the bedroom began to be strictly a personal space. As homes and bedrooms were such public places, it is hard to imagine how young people could date or have private conversations. Most young romantics would wait until the spring and summer months to try and catch the object of their affections on the rare occasion they might be walking outside alone. Much medieval courting was done publicly, and the whole community would know about it. In modern times, another place that we demand privacy is the bathroom. Whether to enjoy a relaxing bath or shower, or to use the toilet, these are activities that we would usually rather do alone. However, this was not the case during the medieval era. Contrary to widespread belief, medieval people knew that there were benefits to washing and bathing. 
Since the Celts, the commoners washed with soap, and medieval citizens knew that washing would help deter parasites and clear up skin infections. Bathhouses, made popular by the Romans, came back into vogue later in the medieval period as a place to socialize. However, just because they washed did not mean they were hygienic. When imagining public baths, you may think of modern swimming pools with people wearing bathing costumes and the water kept clean with chlorine. The communal bathhouses of the medieval period were not like this. Multiple people would bathe naked in the warm water held in wooden tubs without any privacy. Being naked was not as taboo as it is today. Again, we can thank the Victorians for that. And the baths were unisex. Predictably, the communal baths soon became intrinsically linked to sex, usually in front of anyone else who happened to be there. Before long, the bathhouse was synonymous with a brothel, with prostitutes often bringing their clients to conduct business in public. Medieval peasants also bathed in streams and rivers during the hot summer months, not necessarily with soap. Evidently, they thought nothing of stripping down in front of their companions of either sex. The royalty and nobility could afford to have their own baths. However, this didn't make them any more private. Along with attendants to top off the water, friends and family would be invited in. European royalty would try to impress each other with the luxury of their baths. It is said that Charlemagne enjoyed bathing so much that he would invite his sons, nobles, friends, attendants, and bodyguards to bathe with him. A resolute servant of Charlemagne named Einhard reported that sometimes a hundred men or more would be in the water together. Some of us might be able to get on board with sharing a bath, at least with a significant other, but you'd have to be pretty comfortable with someone to poop together. Not so in the medieval era. Public toilets were even more public than they are today. If you lived in a rural area, you would probably relieve yourself wherever you felt the need by digging a hole, doing your business, and filling it back in. You would have one bucket for solids and one for liquids at home. As urination and defecation are natural, the medieval people had no shame in it. Not only did they not need privacy for their excretions, but they also did not mind keeping the waste and putting it to good use. Poop could be sold to farmers as a fertilizer, and urine had several uses, including washing clothes, softening leathers, and quenching steel. Next time you are out at a bar, make a note of the washrooms. No matter how bad they are, they will not compare to the restrooms in medieval inns that consisted of a plank with a barrel underneath to catch the waste. When people started living in cities, sewage became a real problem. Public toilets were a solution to stop people soiling the busy streets. These toilets were often situated on a bridge so that the waste could drop directly into the river. Going to the toilet in a castle was somewhat different. A chamber pot was used for nighttime needs, much like peasants used a bucket. Castles did have inside toilets, called guard ropes, which were a closet-sized space built jutting out of the side of the outside walls. They consisted of a seat with an open hole. The waste fell into a river, the sea, or a moat, depending on where the castle was located. Occasionally, privacy was afforded to those who used the toilet in castles. Some guard ropes had wooden doors or were built at the end of a narrow corridor at a right angle to obscure the view. Despite this extra privacy, the king would often have servants attend to him while on the toilet. Sometimes, if his garments were too awkward to manage by himself, he would employ someone to wipe the royal posterior for him. By the end of the medieval period, a special position was created called Groom of the Stool, and we're not talking about the kind of stool you sit on. As people in medieval times were not ashamed of their bodies or their excretions, it would be easy to believe that they had no notion of privacy. However, this would not be strictly true. While your business would be everyone else's, and news travels fast in closed communities, people still saw value in keeping your thoughts to yourself to spare the feelings of others. Confession, where you could anonymously talk to a priest in confidence, was thought to improve your mental and physical well-being. As wealthy people built guard robes in their castles, it suggests that although they were not averse to going to the toilet in public, they might have preferred to do it in private. Despite medieval women bearing all when bathing, Married ladies would keep their hair covered for modesty, reserving that part of themselves for their husbands. Nuns would also keep their hair private, although you wouldn't see a nun bathing in public. Privacy and being alone were seen as spiritual pursuits. Sometimes nuns, called anchoresses, would shut themselves in a tiny cell next to a church to receive visions of God. 
Hermits, wanting to get closer to God, would go to a wild place to live alone and contemplate religious matters. Sometimes hermits would live near a ford, a forest path, or a marshy swamp to aid travelers by acting as a guide. When we think of privacy in medieval times, it's easy to mistake the lack of privacy for a lack of time alone. Indeed, you could not do much out of the watchful eye of your community, but this stemmed for a desire for connection rather than a lack of awareness about privacy. It seems odd to us today, but who hasn't scrolled through social media while using the toilet, FaceTime someone from bed, or texted while in the bath? When viewing it through a screen, it is easy to distance yourself from the fact that you are voluntarily giving up your privacy. Perhaps technology is undoing the Victorian sensibilities that are still so ingrained in our society and returning us to the unabashed mindsets of medieval times. Still, most people would draw the line at naked communal baths with strangers. To learn more about medieval times, check out our book, The Middle Ages, a captivating guide to the history of Europe starting from the fall of the Western Roman Empire through the Black Death to the beginning of the Renaissance. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. Also, grab your free mythology bundle ebook while it's still available. All links are in the description. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.